To warm up, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, first of all, what I want to do is give the canonical example of an inductively defined type in a dependent setting. But in order to warm up to that, I want to start out with reconsidering the sum of two types. So what I want to do is I want to look at, uh, I want to look at the, uh, well, we've used different terms. Let's call it the binary sum. Yeah. Pardon me, what? What, what? Well, yeah, if I don't get started, people won't come in. <laughs> so what I want to do is the binary sum, which corresponded uh, logically to disjunction. And what I want to point out is that there is a generalization of the rule when you're dealing with families of types. So I'll assume you already have in your head the rule for, uh, for, for the for the dis where the, uh, in the case analysis with a fixed target type for the case analysis, what I want to point out here is that in the case of, uh, in the case of a uh, dependent type, it's a little uh, trickier. So let's look at the introduction rule. So we would have uh, the introduction rule for the binary sum would be, let's say it's A plus B. This is really a warm-up exercise, what I'm doing here. Uh, and I'm going to do uh, a... Ver a ex it's all an instance of an inductive type, but I'm, 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 I'm going to like do it uh, incrementally. Okay, so here is the idea. Uh, let's call that n just to be. Maybe it might be helpful. A plus b, if n is uh, b. Okay, so those are the the two intro rules. So you're familiar with that. And if you read that as or, it's just uh, the, the the choices we have for the. For the for the uh, for the or, and the question is the elimination rule, and in the dependent case, the elimination rule is more interesting than it is in the non-dependent case. So the idea is if I have, you could think of it as a proof of a disjunction, or anyway, an element of this binary sum, which means it's either an A or it's a B, and it's marked uh, according to which one it is. The reason for the marking is to ensure that I can do a case analysis, otherwise it makes no sense to, to, to make, a, to make a, a, a choice. So what we're going to do is we're going to have two cases. So this will be just the syntax will kind of look like what you had. I don't remember or know exactly what Frank wrote, but I'll do something that I hope will look, will look good. Uh, so what we're going to do is a case analysis, okay, which I will fill in, and it's going to have a type here. And the issue is, what is the type of the case analysis? So previously, what we did in the, in the, in the dependent case, I'm going to erase this. This is just like to warm you up. You would end up saying, well, I have a type, and we're going to have a compute a value of an arbitrary type C. That's what we did before, and then we would fill in something here. And what would we fill in? We would say, well, if X is in A, uh, and if Y is in B, and then we'd have two, two cases. So we'd have maybe N and P, and this would be C, and this would be C, and then this would be x dot n and y dot p, maybe. Okay, that would be a reasonable, that's m at least my notation for what you probably already covered. So you, you know what that is. Okay, so that's what you did before. So that's the simple case. But in, when you're dealing with families of types, there's more information to be gained. And another way of saying it is, um, if we think of it, and let's, here's how to motivate it. What we want to do is we want to think of this as an induction principle. Okay, because a case analysis is a form of proof by induction in which there are no inductive hypotheses, really. There are just cases. It's just degenerate. It's an inductively defined type in which there happens to be no recursion. Okay? But the point about the inductively defined type is that you enumerate uh, a fixed number of cases to consider, and perhaps they are also recursive. All right? So let's, m what I'm doing with this example is sort of let's suppress the recursive part. And this is an example of an inductive type. Well, if we think of it as an inductive type, then what we're doing when we do a case analysis like this is we're doing a proof by induction on M. All right? And if you think about how proofs by induction go, well, what are we proving? We're proving C. But really, what we would like to do is we would like to prove it's, uh, the induction principle to be fully general wants to really be a statement about M, not just some fixed uh, proposition C that is uh, completely oblivious to M, but you want to say something about M itself because that's the point of doing a proof by induction. So what's going to happen here is we're going to have M, let me use the variable Z, 
is we're going to say this will be a proof of C holding for M, you know, C of M, a predicate C of M, where this becomes a predicate rather than a fixed type. So with uh, Z being, let's write it Z, Z being of type A plus B, C will be a type. Okay? So this is what we're, what we're doing. And then here, what we do is we want to flow the information into each branch uh, of what we're doing. So in this case, what we're doing is we're trying to prove something. There are two cases to consider, in left and in right, uniformly in whatever they're in left of or in right of. Okay? So these are the two cases. There are no induction hypotheses, but there are two induction steps, if you will. We prove these two cases, and th we prove them for the specific case. So it's in left of x for z, in c, and in right of y, I think I called it, yet yeah, y for z, in c. And so the, that's, the, that's the critical idea, okay? And the definitional equivalence is the same as what you expect. When you do a case analysis, you do a substitution. I won't write that out. But the important point is you get a more refined typing because you're trying to express the principle of proof by induction, okay? So is that clear? So it's props as types, right? So the thing that you need to be, like, really fluid about, and some people have rightfully criticized me for being a little too facile with this, but eventually you, you should be, ha, make, be able to have a very fluid attitude about propositions and types. You should be able to see these things both ways according to what seems suitable in any moment. Okay, so uh, this is a good example of that. So if you think of this as a proposition just because psychologically it helps, then it, it looks more like a, an induction principle. Now, you'll notice here that, uh, let me mention, uh, I want to mention two remarks here. So this idea has been around for decades. It's been around, a, I don't know, at least uh, since the 70s and maybe before that, okay? But it was sort of rediscovered a while ago in the guise of what are called GADTs. And there's some big fall to roll about this, and I find it rather uh, tries my patience. Because the main idea is the idea of learning. The main idea is that when you do the case analysis, you know in the target type which case you're in. You flow the information that you're dealing with the in-left case into the type. That's the critical idea. Okay? That's what's important. The dependent limb has been around forever, and it's really an instance of dependent limbs. Okay, so, uh, so that's a worthwhile thing to mention. The other interesting thing to mention, if you would like to specialize for yourself, it's kind of useful. Let's look at the special case of 1 plus 1, which we could write as 2 for some reason. Uh, and uh, so think of it as A and B are both the unit types. So it's 1 plus 1 or 2, which is the Booleans. So this is a Boolean. So what we have is a, a choice of two types, one for when it's true and one for when it's false. And then what happens is when it's 1 plus 1, the x is of type 1, so we already know it's the null tuple, and the y is of type 1, so we already know it's the null tuple, so we don't really need to even have the x here. And this corresponds to plugging in true, okay, which is in left of null tuple, and this corresponds to plugging in false. And in that case, it's an if statement, if m, then uh, n else p, has type, and then the crucial thing is you plug in the Boolean itself for Z in C. So this guy gets to know, okay, uh, what M is. So in particular, as we develop ideas further, I don't have it, all the material I need on the board yet, but as we develop ideas further, this family could itself be a conditional under certain circumstances. So in other words, the type of an if might well be an if. Okay, and, and what it will do is it will branch on whether M is true or false and give you a type for N and a type for P, thereby completely eradicating like one of the most biggest bugaboos, pointless bugaboos about type systems that supposedly it's some disastrous thing that you can't, uh, that the two branches of the if might have a different type. Look, if you want to do that, then you have to have a more sophisticated type system. That's it. Yes? It's really hard for me to hear you, sir. Oh, because when I, if I think of 1 plus 1 as being 2, then I'll say by definition true is in left of the null tuple and false is in right of the null tuple, just by convention. That's what I'll do. So I write true and false. Okay. Because x being of type 1, we already know it's the null tuple. There's only one element of type 1, so the variable really plays no role. 
So it becomes a constant that you're plugging in true and false. Okay? So the point is you get to do the conditional branch. All right, so that's uh, very useful. We're going to put this thing, uh, so to say, on steroids in a few minutes. Um, so it's worthwhile to understand the core idea before I start getting really carried away. Okay, so is, uh, is, that, uh, is that okay? Are you, you guys okay with that? Okay, good. All right. All make sense? All right. Um, so, yeah, so next time you look at things like G80Ts or something, you should realize that they're desperately trying to do a broken version of, of dependent type theory. Okay? That's all that's happening. Okay, so, uh, good. So that's the binary sums. The next thing I would like to do is um, natural numbers. Okay? So I've, I've held off on doing these for a long time because uh, I wanted to get to this point. So if I were just trying to introduce natural numbers as some kind of data, then what I would do is this. And you don't mind if I'll start being rather uh, terse about everything. So I'll start writing in, uh, this will be nat introduction you know, for zero. And we can have a nat introduction for, uh, there are different ways of defining this, but one would be if I have a number, then I can take its successor or something. That would be the typical way to introduce the, the inductive type of natural numbers. So the thing I want to point out is, is it's a sum, but it's a, so to speak, a recursive sum. In other words, the argument to this, there's two choices, zero successor. The argument here is, again, one of these elements of these types. This is the, uh, the Ur inductive type, of course. And uh, so that's why it's uh, useful to isolate it. So this will be not induction for successor, let's say. OK, that part is not hard. Now, if I were doing only, uh, so let's do one, only the sort of a computational view, and I weren't worried about logic and getting it all to work in, so I'll work in non, I'll call this non-dependent. So this is the sort of thing you see in uh, Gödel's T, if any of you know about that, was a study of this particular, uh, was a particular uh, concept. Then what we would do is we would have a rule that looks like this. And there's going to be exact parallel to what I did before a moment ago with binary sums. That's why I did it. Okay, so I will say, if you give me a number, I want to do something with that number. Okay, and you say to yourself, well, so to speak, what's the point of having a number? Okay, what good is it? You give me a number, 17, what good is it? Well, what it's good for is counting up to that. Okay, that's the idea. That's the whole point of having a number is to count up to that thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to define... Uh, let's say we're going to, I'm going to, I am going to alter this, but we'll say we'll have a type C, right? This is what you do in like Gödel's T. And you say, well, if you tell me, let me call it N0, uh, which is of type C, which is what to do when the number is zero, so how to, how to iterate zero times. And as a function of the answer for our N times, I will tell you, I'll call it N sub S to be emphatic. I will tell you how to bump it up one more, which is the inductive step, then I get a recursor, which works on m and n0, and I called it x dot ns, okay, and it would have type c. So, for example, going back to a couple of lectures ago, I can now really define plus in the following way, right? I can define plus as lambda x in n, lambda y in n, rec, let's say we rec on y, and when y is 0, the answer is x. And if I get, uh, if I get uh, z, uh, then I will uh, do something like, uh, I never know what to do here. What do you do? Successor of z, maybe. OK, or something like that. <laughs> Whatever it is. Yeah, I think that's the right thing. OK, because this is the recursive call uh, of the sum of uh, x and y. And this will be the sum of x and successor of y. Yeah, I think I did it right, actually. OK, but if I didn't, you should fix it. All right. Okay, so that finally, at long last, is the actual definition of plus. And then all the things I said about uh, definitional equality for an ad hocly defined notion of plus will fall out here because the recursor is defined so that on zero with n zero and x dot n s will be definitionally equal to n zero. If you want to iterate something zero times, then that's what you do. And if you want to iterate it one more than m times, then what do you do? You plug in the iteration, the inductive 
the inductive hypothesis is run at m times, plug that in for x in ns. Okay? So those are the definitional equivalences that we will need. Okay, so that finally discharges my obligation that I've had hanging for a while uh, about how you define plus, because if you take that definition and you crank it out with all the rules of definitional equivalence, you will see that either I made a mistake or modulo a mistake, uh, the, the, the definitional equivalence as I stated, the recursion equations I stated are, are, will be true. Okay, yes? I really this the iteration principle rather than the recursion principle. Well, yes, yes. Because yes, without really products, right. this thing is strictly yeah, that's a terminological thing. This is perfectly fine as long as I have Cartesian products around, I can do anything I want. So an exercise define the predecessor. All right, and we'll define the predecessor to have type n arrow one plus n. How about? So if n is zero, the answer is you know error. And if n is uh, you know, a successor, you want it to be the predecessor. Define that using the recursor, it, uh, using this uh, recursion scheme. And it's a little bit trickier than you think. And my hint is uh, use a shift register. OK, this is what's beautiful. Oh, I love this kind of thing. Uh, it's a shift register. It's exactly like if you've ever done any hardware, what you're going to do is shift register. That's your hint, okay? No more, no more hints behind that. So a hint, and we'll talk about it this afternoon in the problem session. Think of a shift register. That may or may not be helpful to you. So <laughs> that might be like a distraction, but it's really true what you do. Okay, so uh, all right, so we'll, uh, uh, we'll come back to that later, okay? So this is what I want to do. All right, so that's what I would have done in the computational setting. But if, I, but if I want to capture the principle of proof by induction, okay, so two would be, I really want to capture the principle of proof by induction. So I want to be in the dependent setting because I want to be talking about predicates. Okay, then what I need to do is generalize in exactly the same way. Right? I have to say what you have is not just a type, but a family of types indexed by natural numbers. Okay. And then the idea is, what N0 is, is a proof that C is true, if you like to think of it that way. C is true for zero. This is exactly the usual thing. This becomes a little more complicated. I have to do something a little trickier here. Okay, what I have to do is I have to put in uh, a number, so it's gonna change a little bit. All right, I have to put in a number, and I have to put in uh, the inductive hypothesis that, well, uh, if I choose x appropriately, it happens to be the same x, then uh, this holds for c. And then I show that ns holds for uh, x plus 1. OK, so this is the form. Show c of 0. Assuming it holds for x, show it holds for x plus 1. And then we have to uh, modify this a little bit. So it takes two arguments like that. And then it's C, whoops, holds for, for whatever your M is. Works like that. And there is the, uh, the general, so this is the, now by editing at the board, this is the, uh, the rule for the general, the dependent case. Okay, so it uh, builds in, so it, it expresses the induction principle. Notice that I can choose C to depend vacuously on X. And then I recover everything I did before because the substitutions are then vacuous and I get back the original computation rule. So it's just a strict generalization. So notice what's happening is this is a, a for loop, right? If you look at it as a computer program, this is a for loop, right? And it's a doing a kind of flow analysis, okay? Because what is happening is when you type check, when you look at the properties of a for loop, you get to know something about which iteration of the loop you're in. Okay? That's a way of thinking about it. So all these things about, you know, these dreary, horrible things about flow analysis and, and program analysis and stuff can all be expressed in a very clean way, okay, in dependent type theory. Okay? This is what is going on. And the critical idea is you're flowing the information about which branch you're in and what, it's, what, it is, what number it is into the branches of the analysis. 
Okay, that's what's happening. So again, it's like GADTs are like this, other things are like this. Okay, so this is uh, the reason I emphasize this is because if you understand dependent type theory, you understand everything. That's the the point. Okay, and so uh, it's kind of the master theory of programming languages. Okay, so this is uh, so that's it for the natural numbers. Okay, now I want to do something that is a, a, a very complicated. Uh, generalization of this idea. Okay, so we should be comfortable. We should now take a moment because if you're not comfortable with anything I've said here, <coughs> this is a very good moment to say that because uh, I'm going to lose you big time in a minute. Okay. form the recursor, let me uh, give you the new equation. So on zero, let me do that. Let's watch what happens and then it, it, I think it will be clearer. So this will be n zero. That's just like before. And then here, if you do the successor of m, okay, then what you do with, with x, y, and s, what is that equal to? Well, what you do is you um, plug in the predecessor along with the result of the recursive call on the predecessor. So you call yourself recursively on the predecessor. And you pass those two bits of data in as x and y in ns. Uh, I forgot who was asking the question somewhere over here. Oh, yeah, I can't see you. You're right behind this other person. Uh, OK, so does that, make, does that make sense? OK, so the, 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 the um, successor step, the inductive step, gets to know what the predecessor is, and it also gets to know what is the result of the recursive call. So this is the IH, because this is the inductive hypothesis, because that is the proof that C holds for the predecessor, when for uh, X. See, I'm plugging in for X with M, and this is rec of M, so that's the proof that C holds, inductively, that's the proof that C holds, for that particular choice of M, and then I must pump it up one more and show the C holes for one more. Okay? You see what's happening? It's very good for us to pause on here because, as I say, if, if, the, if there's anything unclear, uh, I should explain it because otherwise we will be absolutely out to sea in a second. Yep. Yeah, you do because I have to be able to, you know, I, I'm slightly cheating here. I could call, I'm, I'm relying on alpha conversion, but it's the same x, right? This is an x. Uh, so I'm relying on the same x here. If you wanted, I could use a different variable and then plug it in to make it a little more emphatic. But, but yes, of course you need that because it's a predicate, right? <clears throat> when you think about how you do a proof by induction, you're doing some induction on, you know, x or whatever. Uh, you, uh, in the inductive step, you say, well, assume the property holds for x. I want to show it holds for x plus 1. So assume it holds for x, and I want to show it holds for x plus 1. It might very well be, I mean, I don't know what individually what your experience is. It might very well be that nobody has written out for you in logical form what the actual structure of a proof by induction is. You kind of learn to do it by a social process, quite possibly. And it may be that the, the idea of even specifying it precisely is new to you. I, I don't know. I, if that's the case, then you should expect it to take a little while to sink in, okay, what is happening here. <coughs> Because the next, the next thing uses this uh, heavily, this, these ideas heavily. Okay, are we okay enough to go on or no? It's really up to you. I mean, I, you know, yeah. What we're trying to do with what, uh, what you already, uh, what you already explained, why you explained it, and what you're about to explain. Like yeah. it's just very okay. Well, what I'm going to do next is talk about identity types. 
And uh, this uses the same ideas in a very uh, more sophisticated way, I would have to say. Okay, so that's why I'm, uh, so what I'm building up here, what I'm trying to accomplish is to get you to understand <coughs> how principles of proof by induction are represented in dependent type theory. And the critical point is that you work with families of types indexed by the thing you're inducting over and that you flow information into the branches that tells you which particular case you're in. That information about the inductive step flows into the branch so that you can say something in general about any M of an inductively defined type in terms of, well, its composition. So here it's an in left or an in right, or when we edited it with a Boolean, it was a true or false. And here it's a little more fancy. Uh, the possibilities for a number are zero or the successor of another number. So when I do a proof by induction on that, I get an inductive hypothesis suddenly corresponding to the fact that it, this is a recursive process of building one number out of another. So I get to uh, assume it for the predecessor and show it for the successor. That way I know, regardless of what M is, it must either be zero or it must be the successor of something. And if it's zero, I am indeed giving you outright by this definitional equivalence a proof for zero. And by this premise, with this definitional equivalence, I'm giving you a proof for N plus one, successor of M, okay, in terms of a proof for M. And that's what this is expressing. Okay? Yes? Exactly, yes. So this is the inductor principle, and those are the proof terms, yes. Okay, is that good? Is that the yeah, right answer? That's the answer you wanted? Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. The idea is, I'm thinking of these two rules as an inductor definition of the elements of the type, by which I mean uh, it's the least type closed under these rules, okay? So the only thing that is in the type of natural numbers is either zero, because it's that rule, or the successor of one that's already been constructed, and nothing else. That's the so-called extremal clause. So this is an inductive, this constitutes an inductive definition of the type N. If you have any inductively defined type, and over here, these two rules constitute an inductive definition of the sum, of binary sum of two types, okay? Because there's only two possibilities. It's an in left or an in right. I'm enumerating them. <coughs> or if I, <coughs> if I specialize that to Booleans, excuse me, then this would be true and false. There, those are the two cases. So, you know, so-called enumeration types are just a form of inductive type. So in, in CIC, there's a whole general apparatus of inductive types of which everything I'm doing is just a special case. However, to throw the whole general case at you becomes really opaque, okay? So I'm trying to do the, uh, the special cases. Okay, so if you think of this as an inductive definition, <coughs> then what I'm doing here is I'm reasoning from, uh, so here's another way to write this rule. You could do it this way. I could, it's exactly the same thing, but I could change the rule to look like this. I could write it, and I'll, we'll make this, uh, I don't know, U. I need a letter. Okay. So I'm defining a map, and then this would be U over here. It, it's the same thing, but perhaps it would be helpful to do it this way. So I'm defining a mapping. So forget the gamma. I'm saying a mapping from, from N into well, from u and n to u for xc, okay? That is, I'm giving a proof of u for xc uniformly in u. A proof by induction is always defining a mapping, okay? That's what you're, what you're doing. And this is the proof object corresponding to a proof by induction. So if you just look at these as like putting in trues, this says that's true. And assuming this is true, then forget that part, this is true, and therefore uniformly in N, this, uniformly in N with U, uh, that C is true. And that's what the thing is saying. And then the way you get this from that is the inversion principle. If this is the elimination rule, the definitional, the symbolic execution rules are always that the elimination is post-inverse to the introduction. 
So I have two cases to consider. Elimination applied to introduction zero, elimination applied to introduction one. Okay, and then I give the equations that makes that work. Okay, so that's how that works. It's all, <coughs> excuse me, it's all the same pattern. Still not happy. But if I wanted to express the stronger property of proof by induction, then I have to fill in, I have to have a more sophisticated understanding of, of the rule, which allows me to flow the information about which branch I'm in into the predicate. Now it's dependent, yeah. I added it, I added it. When you have case analysis, you have case and it has three arguments and it binds a variable x in one argument and a different variable in principle uh, y in another argument. So it can be written like that. It's a completely systematic way of dealing with binding and scope. <coughs> Amongst many other places, you could look at uh, my Practical Foundations book uh, will uh, explains all of this. Okay, it's not, you know, it, conceptually it's what everyone does. In exact notation, it's probably not exactly what everybody else does, but it, it's conceptually the same. Okay, good enough? Yes, one more. Can I be also a dependent It can also be. Can I explain? Okay, so. Do we have like the dependent type? So can it also be a dependent type? Uh, something can also be a dependent type. Yeah. So X. X. can X also be a dependent type? Uh, what does it mean X? Can we X as a variable here? So I don't quite know what you're getting at. Or like just um, maybe like natural numbers. Like. Oh, and, uh, I and think also it, I mean well, yes, let's not let's uh, let's not go there right now. Okay, let's walk before we run. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. <coughs> yes. I mean, the the real all of its generality works for everything. But as I say, if you go look up somewhere what the general the general formulation of inductively defined types is, it's kind of scary if you're not really if you haven't developed the stomach for that sort of thing. So uh, you have to. Uh, it's a, it gets complicated. It all makes perfect sense, but you have to like build yourself up to it. Uh, Okay, uh, okay, all right. So we'll give you some practice with this. Uh, as maybe as a homework assignment, uh, what I can ask you to do is uh, take this a similar thing. Let me uh, jot down an inductive definition and I want you to generate the rest of the story. Okay, so the inductive definition will be, I'll do something like uh, uh, binary trees. So what I will do is I will say, uh, uh, the empty tree is a tree. And this is the simplest thing I can think of off the top of my head. And if I have two trees, 
then I can form a node which combines them into another tree. So this will be called tree introduction and tree elimination. Okay, and what I want to do is your exercise is uh, a tree introduction. Uh, this is a uh, uh, leaf for E empty, and this is node, and then our exercise is to find an appropriate tree elimination. Uh, yeah, and it's definitional equivalence. Okay, so we'll leave that as an exercise for you. <clears throat> okay, so now what I would like to do is start revisiting this issue of equality. And uh, this, is, uh, this is where things will start getting difficult. Okay, so I spent a lot of time last night working out my story. So let's see how far we're going to get with this, how much trouble I get into, and how quickly. Okay, so <coughs> well, <coughs> to, to recap, <coughs> what I've done so far is I've developed uh, 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 the, the basic framing, of, and, and I've outlined for you the basic framework of dependent type theory. And I've left sort of a, a gaping hole, you could say. So what I did is I uh, introduced, you know, structure like maybe we had all the propositional types, just to remind you. So maybe we have one, zero, and we have uh, uh, A plus B, and we have A cross B, and we have A arrow B, and then I generalize these things, and I have pi X and A B, and I have sigma X and A B, and I put in nat, uh, for uh, discussion, okay? So we put in at least that much stuff so far, all right? So this is the apparatus we have. And the glaring omission that I have from this, I, in order to, for pedagogical purposes, I also chucked in uh, special case things like sequences of numbers up to length x, et cetera, and I put in a few other things there. But if you want to look at this as from the point of view of logic, and if you want to think of this as like, universal quantification and existential quantification and implication and so forth and so on, then the thing I'm missing is the idea of equality, okay? I don't have the idea of being able to express uh, when two things are equal. So what I want to do is I want to introduce what is called the identity type, which in some sense is the most primitive, <coughs> uh, in a certain sense, the most primitive uh, uh, relation which is to say binary family of types that, uh, that you could possibly hope for. So here is the idea. I want to introduce this type, and it's written like this. So it's equality at A of M and N is going to be a type. Under what conditions? <coughs> Pardon me. I, the, my um, allergies are bugging me. Okay, so we have this. Okay, so this is supposed to be the type of proof that M and N are equal. And now we're going to put a question mark there because this is going to be an, a very interesting passage in, the, in my lectures here. Are equal in some sense that we need to elucidate, okay, uh, elements of type <coughs> and what I'm going to do is <coughs> I'm going to develop the, the principles of this as they're classically done, and then I will point out to you that we're in trouble, okay? That the uh, thing is not really working the way you might expect. So that's where I'm going. So sometimes you could use other notation for this, like sometimes it's convenient to write M equals A and but the problem with that sort of notation, you can do that. And sometimes people will use squigglies or something. They use various notations. It is not standard. And it, but the point is it's supposed to be a type. And there's also a judgment of equality, and it gets confusing. And so I'm going to like reserve the equal sign for the judgment, and I'll always write identity for the type so that I hope that will help avoid any, <coughs> <coughs> any confusion. <coughs> So this is a doubly indexed family of types, right? Um, it's a family of types. So for each A, I have a family of types indexed by two elements of type A, M and N. Okay, that's what's going on here. All right, so that's the first point. 
So that's what a binary relation is. It's a propositional function. Thinking of propositions as types or types as propositions, it's a propositional function. Given M and N of type A, it yields a proposition, the proposition that expresses that M and N are equal as elements of type A. You see, <coughs> the idea of type theory is that propositions have interesting structure. Uh, as opposed to the classical logic point of view, which is that there are only two propositions in the world, true and false. Okay, and then you just completely degenerate all of the structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, no, 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 there are <coughs> Booleans are data, propositions are something else entirely. Okay, and that's a very pernicious confusion that is uh, long-standing confusion in the in the literature. And so I would uh, want to draw that out here. So. You must think of this, it's, the, it's a proposition in the sense that it's the type of its proofs. Okay, all right, so that's the idea. So what sort of proofs are there of equality? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to axiomatize this. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to axiomatize equality. I would like to think of the identity type as an inductively defined type according to the following idea. It's the least reflexive relation. Okay? That's an inductive definition. In the same way that when I find the natural numbers, I say it's the least type containing zero and close under successor. I'm going to say it's the least type containing reflexivity. Or another way of saying it, it's the least reflexive relation, the smallest reflexive relation. It's the diagonal, right? If you admit only the diagonal and nothing else, then you've got the identity, right? That's uh, the usual way to think about the identity of relation, right? So, and in classical accounts, of logic, <coughs> the identity relation is utterly boring. It's merely the diagonal. That's because they've suppressed all of the information about what, is, what, what the evidence is for equality. Every, all of the action from here on in will depend on, uh, on, on undoing that mistake. Okay. So I'm going to axiomatize it as the least reflexive relation. So this would be called the identity formation. This is how we form that type. So what is the introduction rule then? What is the identity introduction rule? Well, it simply says that the relation is reflexive. And if I want to be careful, I'll put a sub A there and I'll do this. So it says, if you give me M and A, then I will give you a proof that M is equal to M. And that proof is reflexivity. <coughs> so you have to get used to this idea of proof objects. If you just read this as true, uh, what this says is forget the M part, or you need to know the M part, but you forget this part, and it's just saying that it's true that M is equal to M. It's reflexive, okay? And it's the least reflexive relation in the sense that there are no other introduction rules. That's the only rule there is, okay? Because as the pattern with inductive definitions is, whatever it is I do as the introduction, Whatever introduction rules I have, in this case there's one, I consider it to be exhaustive. Okay? <coughs> and now what I do is I express the, reflex, the, the fact that that's an inductive definition using uh, a kind of an induction principle that lets me reason about it. So now this is where the exact same ideas I've been developing appear again, but in a somewhat more dramatic form. Okay, so let's look what we do here. Now, I know this is going to be tricky, okay? I'm sorry, I can't help it, okay? <laughs> I'm doing my best, all right? So let's, uh, let's, try, to, let's try to figure out what we're going to do here. <coughs> so what would... <coughs> <coughs> what is the principle of proof by induction over the proofs of inequality? You see, I want to talk about reasoning inductively over the elements of this type. In fact, it might even help you at the moment to ignore the fact that I'm expressing equality. Just like suppress that. I've got some J random type, which I just threw up here, that is characterized by this one and only introduction rule. And to hell with what it's supposed to mean temporarily. Okay? Let's just do it. I think this may be the most helpful way to approach it. Okay? It's just an inductive definition. Okay? So, <clears throat> what am I going to do? What I'm going to do is I'm going to provide some kind of uh, an induction principle. What did I call it? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It's always called J. Okay. It's always called that. 
so we're going to call it that, okay? It doesn't mean a damn thing, okay? But it's called J. So what we're going to do is we're going to have J of something, okay? There's going to be some stuff filled in here. And it's going to be a proof of M for X. Well, it's going to be a little more complicated than that. <coughs> All right. That's partly where we get, where this thing gets complicated. But we're going to use it to prove something. So the idea is that we're going to say, let me get my letters right, because <coughs> if I screw up my letters, then I'll be endlessly flailing away here. So, okay, so let's try to get my letters right. So the general pattern of a proof by induction is I've got an unknown, unspecified object of the inductively defined type. <coughs> so I've got an element P of the inductively defined type that's inductively defined by this rule. And I want to reason from that fact. Okay? So what I want to do is I'm going to leave a little space, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute on P in some manner, and I'm going to wind up with something that goes here. And there's going to be a question as what would go there. Okay, if I were not worried about dependencies and predicates, then what would go here would be some C, where C would be an arbitrary type. That would be the non-dependent form. The non-dependent form is next to useless, but <coughs> I just want to like help you get your bearings by comparing what, we've, what I'm doing here with what I've done before. So this will have to get fancier, so don't take it too seriously at the moment. Okay, but this is the <coughs> approximate idea. So... What do I know about P? I mean, P is an arbitrary element of this type, this crazy type I came up with. So it must eventually boil down to an instance of reflexivity because this is the only introduction principle there is. Okay, it's a complicated computation, but at the end of the day, when you run it, it's got to be reflexivity in the same way with these other things. So what I, that's the only eventuality I have to prepare for, right? I have to prepare for the eventuality <coughs> that P is, in fact, reflexivity. So what that means is that there's some element X of type A, right, written like that, which is going to re represent this term M, this is the argument to reflexivity, in the same way that we had an argument to in left or something over here. So this represents that argument, okay? And I'm going to compute on that basis. And if I were being dependent, if I were being non-dependent, which is not very useful, but if I were being non-dependent, then the J rule would look like this. And then the definitional equality would say, if you give me REFL of M with X dot Q, then that's definitionally equal to M Q. That would be the idea. This is not right yet. We have to make this a little fancier. But that would be like our first cut at it, right? From a, just a purely computational point of view, take an arbitrary P, it must eventually be a REFL, be prepared to handle the reflexivity of some x. We don't know what x is. Okay, so q is acting with reflexivity, and then I do that, and when it really is reflexivity, you just plug in that m for x, and we've got q, and we're done. Okay, that would be good if that's all we had to do. <coughs> but the truth is, I want to express a proof by induction, okay? And so the idea is I have to, like, have some additional data over here. So now if we look at the sum, you'll notice, in the case of the sum, we had some idea of that C could depend upon the element of A plus B under consideration because that's what gets plugged in. So we would want, by the same kind of reasoning, we would want with Z being id A, and now I don't know what to write here, that's the issue, id A something or other, then I want C to be a type. And then, at that point, we're going to want to plug in uh, P for that Z inside of C. That's what we would want to do, okay? Because, you see, C wants to be a predicate about the object in question of this inductive type. Okay, good. That's what we want to do. However... In order to behave generically, right, I need to say something about what goes in here and here. So the idea is it's an inductively defined family of types. You see, that's the trickiness here. Unlike the natural numbers, this is like someone asked this question earlier, and now this is where it comes up. So unlike the natural numbers, where you just have a fixed type that is inductively defined, 
it would be as if the M and the N were suppressed, like it's just id A. Okay, then we wouldn't have any problem because we would just write id A here and Z would be that and we'd plug in P and we'd be off to the races, we'd be good. Okay, but this is not a single inductively defined type. I am simultaneously inductively defining an infinite family of types indexed by pairs of elements of type A. That's where it gets complicated and I think that was your question. Okay, so now I'm answering it. Okay, <coughs> so what we have to do is, is that, uh, oh, I, I did this wrong, uh, should be a comma. So what we have to do is we have to have an XA and a YA, and Z is an arbitrary proof of X, and C gets to depend on X, Y, and Z. So C has to be a family of types that's prepared to work for any two elements of A and any proof that they are equal, or any element of this weird inductively defined type. So that here, what do we plug in? So something goes in for X, Y, Z inside of C. And what should it be? Someone tell me. What is the, what is the inductive step? What is the generic case that I have to prove? <coughs> you should be able to tell me now what, what things. So the three things get plugged in, one for X, one for Y, one for Z. What do I plug in? Someone have it a go. I can't tell who's talking. Yeah. It's hard for me to hear you. Um, the last one could be a reflexive. Oh, uh, reflexive of what? Uh, reflexive of um, A with. Um, yeah, with the what argument? I with what? Um, okay, with A with E. No, with X. I think someone said yes. So what you want here is <coughs> this to be a raffle of X. True, because in the same way that over here you plug in in left of x, right, into c. So I'm plugging in refl of x for z, okay, but that's, and this is the x in question. But what do I plug in for x and y? Because you see, c is assuming you're giving me a proof of reflexivity of something. So reflexivity is a proof of, uh, it's an element of identity of what? x and x. So this is x, x. Okay, that's what goes there. Okay, and that's th and then here, what I plug in is <coughs> uh, I've forgotten. Oh yes, M N. Uh, let me let me write it out. M N and P for X Y Z in C. And then the uh, and the computation rule remains the same. It doesn't change. It's just I have a more precise typing. And this is the itty limb. Okay, so <clears throat> here's a way of saying it is. If I want to prove something about a proof of an identity, it's enough to prove something about the reflexive instance because the identity is the least reflexive relation. So an induction principle always reduces an abstract situation to a concrete one. So with mathematical induction, you say, oh, I want to prove something about X of type natural number. It suffices to show that the thing I want to prove holds for zero, holds for one, holds for two, holds for three, holds for four, holds for five, holds for all infinitely many concrete instances. You say, if I can do that, then it's sufficient to work for an abstract X. That's what a principle of induction is. Over here, when I do case analysis, I want to do a principle. I want to reason by induction over M, which is of type A plus B. Oh, who knows what M is? It suffices to cover the two concrete instances, in left of blah. It, well, it's not two. It's infinitely many, but two forms. In left of something and in right of something. And if I can prove it for each of those, then for all of those infinitely many cases, then I have proved it for the general case, the abstract case. So that's what's happening here. I have an unknown proof. All right, of the identity, it's enough to prove something on the basis of it being reflexivity, which of course relates X to X. <clears throat> okay, that's the idea. All well and good, but now, the, now it's going to get really hard. Okay, so we'll, we'll, uh, I'll show you uh, some, some things next. Okay, are you uh, with me so far? <clears throat> uh, I fully admit it's a non-obvious thing. And by the way, a lot of times people will put like X, Y, Z, 
dot C down here as a kind of parameter to J. That's why I left room there. And this type, I should have told you this before, in all of these inductive types, there's a nice terminology. This is described as the motive. Okay? And would, the same would be true over here. This third party type that is uh, participating in the induction is called the motive. So a lot of times it's just nice to have a word for that, and that's a nice word for it. <coughs> okay, so we can call that the, the motive. <coughs> so, uh, so often the motive is written as a kind of subscript on J. That's a technical detail about the syntax that I'm being rather cavalier about in my lectures because it becomes too, you, you can't deal at such a level of detail all the time. Okay, so, um, so I'm being a little cavalier about it, but often people will, will put the, We'll put the motive on J. Okay, so that's called the J or identity limb. Okay, in the Nordstrom book, this is called J is called ID peel, which is not my favorite term, and nobody nobody else has ever used that term as far as I know, so that that doesn't come up. Okay, <clears throat> and in a very general framework of inductive definitions like you have in CIC, this whole thing is just a special case of an inductive type and. Uh, everything is like, you know, emerges from the general case. Yeah. So, whenever we define a new logical connective, we define um, like the, the coherence properties, like the reduction and the expansion to make sure that the intro and limb rules actually make, make sense. Yeah. <laughs> is there something we can prove for this, for like, to make sure this really complicated thing that we've just written no, down? See, that methodology is a bit problematic. Okay. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> is there a less the best way to explain yeah. that is through category theory, uh, and that's what Steve will be talking about eventually. And in the category theory, there is uh, basically what is called a universal characterization of the connectives, and they're, 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 yes, and it's their universal character that corresponds to that principle of, uh, of <coughs> some local soundness and completeness. And I'm going to leave it at that. Okay. So a full discussion of that is best. The, the equality that you have there, yeah. isn't that a, a, a local reduction? Isn't that the, the reduction that shows that the elimination matches the induction? That shows that what? That the elimination matches the induction, the fact that your reduction... Yeah, so this is the limb of intro, yes. Yeah, so that we have. That we have, yeah. yeah. But the universal part of it, the... I don't... Steve will get to this. Okay, uh, let, me, let me... I'm going to dodge this, okay? Mm -hmm. There's a universal condition, and... Uh, if you don't know what a universal construction is, that's something you need to learn in category theory, right? So one of the most important ideas in category theory is this uh, idea of universal construction. And, uh, and he will explain things in terms of universality. So the, it will emerge out of the fact that N will be something called an initial algebra or functor. And the initiality expresses a kind of universal condition that corresponds to the thing you're looking to. <coughs> Otherwise, I'm going to now start lecturing in category theory. So, <clears throat> okay, so we're going to, I'm going to dodge that question. Okay. All right, are you with me so far? Okay, so now we'll have some little puzzles for you and some <coughs> very, now some very interesting things happen. Okay. So what I would like to say, uh, th this is where the fun begins. So what I would like to say is, what we have done with the identity type, the terminology is to say that we have in a certain sense, I'll just scribble it here for lack of a better place. What we've done is we've internalized, inter we internalized equality. So equality is something we were talking about from my first lecture, the idea of equality of proofs. And what I've done is I've internalized the concept of equality as a type, okay? I have a type of proofs of evidence that things are equal. So I've internalized it into the theory, okay? So as it will come out in the category theory, what I've done is a kind of internal hom, it's called, okay? And you will, you will see that, how that comes out uh, later on, okay? So I've done an internalization. The identity type, by the way, for those of you who are au fait with such things, should be thought of as a hom, um, but we will, um, uh, we'll get that. Uh, we'll get to that uh, shortly. Okay, that has to do with something called the 
the groupoid structure of the identity type, and I will get to that in a minute. Okay, in order to get my way to the groupoid structure of the identity type, what I would like to do is, uh, first of all, do some very trivial things. So, first of all, I would like to prove that equality is symmetric. Now, this is a very simple one. And I'm going to give you, as a homework exercise, the proof that equality is transitive. And I'll give you a hint in a minute. <clears throat> this will be homework. It's substantially harder. <laughs> but I'll show you how we deal with equality of symmetry. So what do I mean by that? What I want to say is that, let me check my letters to make sure I like say everything in the, the right sort of way. So here's one way to do it. Okay. So for any M and N, <coughs> I will say, if you give me a proof that M is equal to N, I can turn that into a proof, I'll call it sim of X. I'm going to define what that is, which is a proof that it A and M. And in fact, uh, the other notation, sim of X, can also be written <coughs> as X inverse. We'll see why in a minute, okay? <clears throat> the reason is, is that what I'm heading toward is the idea of what is called, what I mentioned a moment ago, called a groupoid. A groupoid is best thought of as, you could say, a constructive equivalence relation. It's an equivalence relation that's equipped with evidence. So we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute because there's something really beautiful there. Okay, but first let's, let's see. So we're going to define... So we're going to define sim such that, <coughs> say, excuse me, define sim such that this is the case. So for any proof of m v equal to n, it turns it around and gives you a proof that n is equal to m. And how are we going to do this? And as a matter of uh, honesty, you know, I spent a good 10 minutes or so last night while watching TV trying to figure out the damn proof. It took me several times. I have it crossed out here in my notes. Uh, you, can, you can see. So I didn't get it right the first time either, so let's do it. <coughs> okay, so the trick on these proofs is to find the right motive. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to find the right motive. Okay, that's the hint. And the same here is going to be, the hint is find the motive. Once you know what the motive is, you've got everything. Okay? So we've got to do this. So let's watch what we're going to do here. So I'm going to just do this one. I'm going to, you know, we're getting nearer to lunchtime. So I'm just going to pull this right out of my, uh, out of the air <laughs> and tell you that the motive in question is this. Oops. It'll seem like magic. Okay, this, this kind of proof is sort of a magic thing because I will show you that it works, but it, it's just like it's like uh, the worst form of blackboard math. You know, you just say, uh, ha, 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 here's the proof, and you get, cover your tracks. You don't say anything about how you found it. Okay, so the W plays no role here. I could play some underscore. Okay, <clears throat> so this is my motive. That's my C. Okay, this is going to be the motive in this particular case. That's my C. Okay, I see. So, <clears throat> what I want to do is I'm going to define sim, okay, to be a J with that motive. So, I won't write it down here again. That will be my motive for J. And I will do induction on X. Okay? And uh, it helps me if I use the, <coughs> the right uh, notation. Yeah. So, we'll do Y here. So, it'll be Y dot something. Okay, I'm going to define it to be this. And the point will be, right, that this at the end will have type id, well, it's going to be, let's do it out. It will be uh, plug in m and n for u and v and plug in x for nothing because it's not used. So its type will be plug in m and n, oops, for u and v in id a v u. So that, of course, is id a and m. That's how I got it. Okay? 
the way I found the motive was, I know that whatever I'm going to do here <coughs> has to be, okay, the result of the J will be plug in M, N, and well, X, but it doesn't matter, okay, for U and V inside of something. So I swap them in order to get it A and M, which is what I wanted, okay? This is what, what I'm doing up here. So what goes in here? Well, the thing that goes in here has to be, what is the type of the thing that goes in here? So this will be called that Q. And Q has to have type what? Uh, well, I have to need a notation. Given X in A, Q has to have type the motive instantiated with X in X. So it's id A, plug in X and X, right? Because that's right up here. X, X gets plugged in. So I do that. Okay, so what should Q be? Well, just make it, oh, I called it Y, so let's call this Y. Uh, what should Q be? Well, let's say REFL A of Y. That's of type, oh, that would be Y again, I'm sorry for the change of variable. Okay, uh, so it would be REFL Y. So this guy is REFL. And we're done. <coughs> so what I've done here is I've argued, it's, it's, from a certain point of view, it's trivial, but I'm, I'm leading you somewhere, okay? So from what, what I've argued is the least reflexive relation is symmetric. Of course, if you picture it as a diagonal, that's obviously symmetric matrix, if you want to think of it like a matrix, a two by two, or a, excuse me, a two-dimensional thing. Obviously, it's symmetric, okay? So that's what I've done, okay? That's what I'm doing here. All right, so what we're going to do with equality is transitive, what you're going to do is you're going to find trans of x, y such that given a proof of m and n and given a proof of n and p, I'm going to say trans x, y is going to be a proof of id a uh, m and p. Okay? That's, that's the... That's the exercise. In this notation, this is often better written as y after x or y times x, if you want to do it like that. But let's write, use composition. It's going to be composition. It is composition. <coughs> okay. Why is it composition? Why is that the right way to think about this? Well, let's see. Let's see what's going on. You know the notion of a Hasse diagram, right? The idea where you draw arrows around points to indicate when things are less than each other, right? So what I do is I say, well, every element, if this is a point in A, then we can say this is, says that, it's less, uh, that that point is less than itself. And we can label that with, uh, with information. That's REFL. Uh, let's say it's X if this, is a guy is, if this point is called X. Then REFL of X is a evidence for the fact that x is equal to itself. Then we have a rule that says, if you have points x and y, call them points x and y, and you have some proof p, okay, that, <coughs> that uh, relate, that tells us that, oh, I see, uh, yeah, that, that tells us that x is less than or equal to y, that's the intuition. Then what I do is I say, oh, and moreover, there is an associated map, P inverse, or sim of P, which tells us Y is less than X. So let's just write it like that. I don't need the dots, really. <coughs> okay, I can write it like that. And then transitivity says, <coughs> if I can go uh, from X to Y by P, and if I can go from Y to Z by Q, then I can go from X to Z by doing Q after P. That's what is being said here. And this was trans. This is transitivity. So the idea is if you think of this, the arrow is representing. So this represents the idea that X is, so to say, less than or equal to X. But it's going to turn out to be a symmetric and transitive relation. So I could use for my preorder a notation like triple bar or something. Oh, I better not do that. Uh, I need some. No, let's twiddle. I don't know. Okay. So X is related to X. And this tells us that if X is related to Y, then Y is related to X. And this tells us that if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, then X is related to Z. Oops, 
x is related to z. That's what is being said here. But, but, what I'm doing is I'm equipping things with evidence because I'm a good constructivist. There are no just bald facts in the world. You have proofs of them, okay? So these are the proof objects, okay? The proof objects, okay? So there are proof objects that witness the symmetry and transitivity of the internalized equality. That's what I'm writing down. So now what you start to see is I have some structure. And the structure I'm beginning to have is if you look here and here, I have the structure of a category. And if I look here, I have a structure of a category in which every map is invertible. Okay? That is called, it begins to be, it's heading towards, I'll write towards because there's something else needed. It's heading towards what is called a groupoid. So we might call this a pre-groupoid. Okay? So we'll say, we'll call that a pre-groupoid. Why do I call it a pre-groupoid? Well, because we need some additional conditions. So I'll make some words for ourselves. <clears throat> okay? uh, and the additional conditions we're going to need are the axioms of a groupoid, which tell us that in some sense, P inverse after P must in some sense be equal to whatever I mean by that, and that we're going to come back to, the identity or reflexivity. So this reflexivity could also be written identity. Okay? So this is reflexivity or identity. Okay, and it should be that P after P inverse in some sense of equality should be the identity. Plus we should have associativity, don't make me write it out. Okay, and uh, unit elements. So we should say if we have the identity composed with P should be in some sense the same as P and P composed with the identity should be in some sense the same as P. Okay, plus associativity and if I didn't miss out anything, then we have the structure of a groupoid. You can look at it as a generalization of the notion of a group because we have uh, identities, we have inverses, and we have multiplication. Okay, it's so unit element, inverses, and multiplication. So there's some structure there that looks like a group. It's called a groupoid. Okay? <clears throat> so what I'm doing here is I'm trying to elucidate, I'm trying to bring out the groupoid structure of the identity type by doing these two examples, just to find out. I haven't considered these yet. These are big question mark. I'll come up with this later. So another way to think about this, because we're getting to lunchtime, so let me uh, close off. So another way to think about this is that we can think of these proofs of identity as paths in a space. So the idea, this says there's always a path from X to itself. Now, that path is a little hard to draw because the identity path is really the one that doesn't go anywhere at all. Okay, because if I think of this as sitting inside some space, A, this kind of looks like it goes somewhere and like crosses through other points. That is not what I mean. It's very difficult to depict, okay? I really want the path that doesn't go anywhere, okay? So, but we often draw it like that and by labeling it the identity, I'm reminding you that it's the path that doesn't go anywhere. And so this says, if you're in a space like A, let me go back here. If you're, if you're in a space like A, and if you have a path, we'll draw it as a kind of wiggly arrow from sort of X to Y, then you can turn that path around and you can go back the way you came. So that's its inverse. And then the other is that if you have a path from X to Y and a path from Y to Z, then I can compose those and get a path from X to Z. And of course, therefore, back. <coughs> All these things go back, or I could, do, I could notate this another way, which is to just put a bidirectional arrow, because we think of paths as being reversible. Okay? And we get diagrams like that. Okay? And this concept of a path is a central notion in the idea of what is called homotopy theory. Okay, is the idea of paths in a space. Okay, so you can think of it as um, ways in which what it, what, it, what it can be thought of is that it's okay to move from X to Y because I can walk along that path. I can squish X and Y together because there's a path between them. I can walk X along Y and contract that path. Okay, the space is contractible in a certain way. All right, that is the idea. And then 
what you do is you look at the contractibility properties of paths in order to say something about the overall structure of the space. And the particular example that people usually do is if I put a little box here to indicate a hole in the space, so A consists of everything but that, then I cannot contract this path to this path because you can't get past the hole. Okay? And so those issues of contractibility are what tell you something about the overall structure of the space. Okay? That is the idea. Okay? So here's something that is like extremely kind of geometric and topological in flavor. But in fact, it is, and it, it is given beautiful and direct expression in constructive type theory. Once you start seeing this, I'll develop these ideas further, you, you, then you can understand why I am such a fervid, fervent believer in type theory, okay? Because there are no accidents in the world. This is not like some random coincidence, okay? This is telling us that computation, the essence of what type theory is all about, is at the bottom of even things that seem so far-fetched and abstruse and far, far afield as, you know, uh, deformations of spaces and of topological spaces is actually an issue of computation. And it turns out a lot of things that are done in algebraic topology to understand the structure of spaces amount to functional programs. You'll be amazed at what they're doing when you finally realize that they're really talking about functional programming with dependent types. It's astonishing, extremely beautiful. In fact, there's a whole year of program being devoted to this uh, in Princeton next year. Starting this year, people are talking about these ideas. So this is the beginning. So the reason I say it is by way of getting you motivated, okay? So see if you can figure out how to define transitivity. It's not easy, okay? But the hint is find the motive, okay? If you can find the right motive, <coughs> then you'll, you'll be off to the races. Okay, so I'm going to talk a lot more about these issues of equality in my next lecture, and, um, and we'll come back to some of this. Okay, so I hope that whets your appetite and 